Well, we're going to start the, the next panel, uh, which is, is focusing on recent developments in the South China Sea. Uh, we have a, a great lineup of panelists from the region who are going to talk about the, uh, the uh, developments over the past 12 months or so in the region. Uh, I'd just like to remind people that uh, the following us online and those that want to Twitter, you can Twitter at Southeast Asia DC and at CSIS using hash mark CSIS live. So uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. There's a, a longer bio that has been handed out. I'll, uh, and then uh, I'll briefly introduce them and then they'll each make about 10 minutes of comments and then we'll switch to Q&A, the same format we've followed this morning. Our first panelist is uh, Dr. Wu Shikun, who is president of the National Institute or the South China Sea Studies. And on Dr. Wu's right is Dr. Renato de Castro, who's a professor at De La Salle University in, in the Philippines. And on his uh, left is Dr. Ian Hui Song, who is a research fellow in the Institute of European and American Studies. And on his left is Dr. Tran Trung Tui, who is the director of South China Sea Studies uh, program in the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. So, Dr. Wu, yes. please. Okay. Thank you, Maury. Good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen, colleagues. You know, someone said that the panel after lunch would be a little bit uh, sleepy. So I'm here now a little bit uh, uh, sleepy. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to sit in this panel of recent development of the South China Sea dispute, which have caused a general international apprehension, the frictions and uncertainty of the year of 2012 and 2013 will continue to, to the coming years with increasing disharmonies and escalation. Taking this opportunity, I would like to share with you my observation on the South China Sea dispute, which I will illustrate from six basic concerns. One, sovereignty concerns. The climate states of the South China Sea region are taking various measures to consolidate their territorial and maritime claims. The disputes are now over actual jurisdiction rather than over the previous nominal claims. For example, unilateral drilling for resources in the disputed area by some of the claimants has become a common practice in the South China Sea. This is contrary to the practice of joint development in a maritime zones pending for delimitation. This coupled with the involvement of international oil companies has made the South China Sea disputes more complicated and internationalized. Oil and gas exploitation in the disputed area will increase the risk of unchecked incidents or even serious conflict. Two, balance concerns. If my uh, time is over, just stop me. <laughs> At the moment, although the overall situation in the South China Sea remains stable and manageable, there do exist a number of destabilizing elements. It has allowed our concern to see that as the United States has its begun its strategic pivot to Asia or strategy of rebalance and enhanced its presence in the Asia Pacific, some countries have taken the opportunity to pressure China by allying themselves with non claimant states. All these have added to the complexity and the uncertainty of the South China Sea issue. This is a rather overt and clumsy effort by these states to internationalize the issue at hand. Three, legal concerns. Many climate kind of states have recently redrafted domestic legislation to bring it to line with accepted international law. 
in particular, they are looking to make their legislation acceptable within the scope of uh, NCLOS. These are purely physical attempts at legality designed in the pursuit of a narrow national self-interest. This new trend brings a new dimension to the existing disputes. Four, administrative concerns. It is realized by current states that enhanced, enhanced presence in the areas under dispute will strengthen future petitions. Bearing this in mind, all current states have taken various dubious measures to consolidate their presence in the Nansa or Spratly Islands. Therefore, to reinforce their claims, every kind of legalistic rules has been employed. This includes the building of civilian facilities, such as schools, hospitals, and sending monks, government officials, to the occupied features. Five, territory concerns. The focus of the South China Sea dispute has moved away from pure interest in the sovereignty of futures towards the legal implications as presented by international laws. In other words, what deserves further consideration is that to what extent that a country might expand their maritime jurisdiction from their occupied features. Six, military concerns. It is worrying, to say the least, that we observe the recent arms build-up within the region. Relative to countries bordering the South China Sea are all mounted efforts to purchase advanced weapons. This has acted as a catalyst to the practice of joint military exercises and military control exercises. The increase in military activity will not in mind lead to instance arguments, recriminations, and inevitably worse. This constitutes a serious security threat to the South China Sea region. A stable and peaceful South China Sea is in the interest of all criminal states and indeed of a wider international community. China plays an important dynamic and a constructive role in achieving this much desired goal. Therefore, I would like to share with you my own observation on China's policy. I will do this by explaining six key objectives of China's policies in this region. First, the peace objective. China will always follow the road of peaceful development and never seek confrontation. China has indisputable sovereignty over the four island groups in the South China Sea and their adjacent waters, which is based first and foremost upon history. First discovery, first mapping, first naming, and first occupation. The successive administrations have kept this historical claim in accordance with the international law. Within the historical U-shaped line, or nine dash line in West, China claims sovereignty over all land features and enjoys historic rights, such as fishing, among others. China has never raised sovereignty demands over the entire South China Sea and will never make demands beyond its historical rights. The intentional Confusion disseminated by some countries concerning China's demands in the South China Sea create contradictions and distortions of these historical facts, which only serve purposes to those of a peaceful settlement of the issues. Second, the legal objective. I would like to emphasize China has always adopted a coherent policy on the South China Sea. China has proposed that the Kremlin states should resolve their problems through negotiations 
on the basis of fully respecting history of the South China Sea in accordance with international law. Third, the security objective. It is third, yes. Uh, as one of the countries benefiting significantly from free and safe navigation throughout the South China Sea, China has played and will continue to play a constructive role in maintaining peace and stability in the region. My third, uh, fourth point is the diplomatic objective. China has proposed, proposed a policy of putting aside disputes and going for joint development, while the climate states may maintain their own interpretations on the provisions of a convention, and they should discuss and reach consensus on the temporary arrangements such as joint development. Fifth, being constructive. China is playing a constructive role in maintaining peace and stability in the South China Sea. In 2002, China and ASEAN countries uh, reached a consensus uh, on the DOC, which aims to enhance mutual political trust and promote cooperation through the joint efforts of China and the whole ASEAN partners. And drafting the upcoming Code of Conduct the COC is one part of this engagement. Uh, it would uh, start sometime this year, uh, China with ASEAN counterparts uh, from the track 1.5. Six, being constructive, China will benefit our practical cooperation in the South China Sea to achieve peace and stability in this region. Uh, this practical cooperation is cardinal. China's proposal to establish a three billion IMB fund for maritime security cooperation has been warmly welcomed by both climate states and non climate states. It will serve to promote mutual dialogue between China and ASEAN partners. Uh, time is over? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I will. Uh, end my presentation. I will you know, uh, address uh, the concerns during the Q&A question uh, sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Dr. DeCastro? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like, first of all, to express my utmost appreciation for being given the opportunity to express, express my view regarding the, this very important issue in the South China Sea. And my focus will be on what happened on Scarborough Shoal and of course the aftermath effects. My presentation would cover basically uh, you know, the general overview. I will not discuss the two month standoff, but basically what were the key features that became very apparent during this two month standoff. Then try to assess why it happened, and of course looking at what I call the ripples effect, and of course just going to my conclusion. Now uh, let me just focus on the general overview if you talk about why did you have the standoff, and the simple reason is the fact that you have, of course, China's approach as the biggest power in the region and, of course, having the most extensive maritime claim. Nobody can deny that China has responsibility whether the issue would be resolved peacefully or will lead to dispute. And basic uh, our contention there is China's approach is classic real politic. Other would say it's assertiveness or reactive assertiveness. It's classic real politic. And uh, you get it basically from the former Chinese foreign minister just uh, after the July, uh, during the uh, Hanoi ASEAN Regional Forum. China is a big power, you are just small power, and that's the reality you'll have to accept. And of course, this real, real politic approach is also expressed by, of course, cynical view regarding international law and the fact that uh, other countries, literal states, simply have no legitimate claim because China's claim is indisputable, basically ignoring that you know, literal coastal states might have certain uh, degree of legitimacy regarding their claim. And of course, historically, if you look back into Europe, a uh, real politic approach usually would generate escalation, and that's what's basically happening right now. So uh, let me just focus on the you know, key points that happened dur during the two-month uh, standoff. Number one, of course, you have the use of naval Brinkmanship using civilian vessels. You have a situation where you have one Philippine Coast Guard vessel being confronted by four 
Chinese maritime surveillance vessel. And of course, in the backdrop, you have the ships from the People's Liberation Army's Navy. Then, of course, coercive diplomacy in terms of a number of points. Like you have, of course, that the dispute has been triggered by the Philippines, that every responsibility lies on the Philippines. There's a saying, takes two to tango. You know, you cannot just have a conflict just because of one party involved. And something that really irritated us during the standoff was the fact that the Philippines is simply an extension of U.S. foreign policy. That we are standing off against China because the Philippines is simply a lap dog or a running dog. That we simply don't have any issue at stake, of course, our exclusive economic zone. And what we're basically doing is because you have the strings that runs all the way from the Pacific cross continental USA into Washington, D.C. So uh, that's really, you know, that we don't have an issue with China. Then, of course, use of economic linkages like the Philippine bananas, and of course, applying pressure, tourism, so forth and so on, which taught the current administration a lesson. It doesn't pay to be economically interdependent on China because it will be used against you. I think this should also apply to other major economic partners of China. And I think we could afford to irritate China every now and then because among the ASEAN countries, we are the least economically interdependent to China and we will make sure that it remains that way. Philippine economic dynamism is triggered by remittances from overseas workers and from business processing organization coming from the United States. Then, of course, the threat of force, which became very vocal. You have a lot of uh, Chinese newspaper, basically. You have a lot of Chinese generals saying, it's time that we have to teach the Philippines a lesson. You know, the lesson that they will never forget. Plus, of course, what is very interesting is what I would call a formulation of historical myth to justify current claim with regards to the Scarborough Shoal. You don't have any Chinese for, uh, for presence there when it was called Bajo de Masinloc by the Spaniards. You don't have any Chinese presence there when it was being used as a target practice by the 13th Air Force and by the United States Navy. It only became a Chinese territory at the onset of dispute waving back as, as far as the Yuan dynasty. Now, what's basically the factors that account for dispute? Of course, key factor there is China's assertiveness and real politic approach. And another factor, of course, is to happen in Philippine domestic politics, which we could discuss later, that you have a change in administration from the Arroyo administration to, of course, the Aquino administration, which, of course, account for a lot of ch dynamics, you know, for one thing or the other. During the time of the Arroyo administration, there was a perception that you know, China's basically had that foothold in the Philippines, that sooner or later the Philippines would be win away from the United States. Of course, everything changed when you have a change in administration. Okay, you know, we could discuss later on joint maritime seismic undertaking, what accounts for this. And of course, we cannot deny it, U.S. strategic pivot and of course our alliance with the United States provided the Philippines a degree of confidence to stand up against China. Now let me just proceed to the aftermath of the Scarborough sh uh, Shoal. Uh, standoff, number one, it basically provided China, I would use the term a template, in pursuing its, I'd call, real political approach, as you see what's happening in the Senkaku, that the same for formula could be applied to Japan, and of course, you have the continuing application of coercive diplomacy to justify de facto occupation of the Scarborough Shoal. In November 2012, you have a, a, a ranking official, who used to be the ambassador in Manila, Fuyi, who went to Manila and tried to basically negotiate the issue with a number of conditions. We could not uh, consult other ASEAN countries. We could not consult the United States. We could not even come out with a media release regarding the negotiation. Uh, in a way, that really pushed the Philippines. If somebody will ask, you know, what pushed the Philippines to basically uh, go to the United Nations? It's China's pressure, China's real politic approach. It's more of an act of desperation. And then, of course, uh, and of course, I will not discuss about the Philippine filing of a claim in the arbitrage tribunal. I'll just go to my conclusion. In a way, what's happening right now is you have dramatic escalation. Uh, the Scarborough Shoal is not part of the uh, Spratleys. It's closer to Luzon, but of course, it has become a potential uh, uh, power, powder keg in the South China Sea. And of course, right now, it's emboldened China to apply the same template in the Ayuning Shoal. And uh, you know, we can discuss it further. So what's happening is you have increased in tension. And let me just, you know, to end my short discussion, let me just quote Mao Zedong. Hopefully, a single spark that can st uh, start a fiery fire 
would not happen in the South China Sea in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. DeCastro. Dr. Song? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Hebert, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to begin my th uh, by thanking CSIS for inviting me to attend this uh, very important and timely uh, South China Sea Conference. And this is my first time uh, to this very important think tank, CSIS. Uh, thank you very much for that invitation. I, I believe all of you can be, uh, agree with me that uh, Taiwan is one of the claimants and stakeholders in the South China Sea. Accordingly, Taiwan has an abiding interest and a legitimate right to participate in the regional security dialogue mechanism that deal with the South China Sea issues. Since May 2008 until today, Taiwan's South China Sea policy has been implemented in accordance with the four basic principles, namely safeguarding sovereignty, putting aside the disputes, insisting on peace and reciprocity, and promoting joint development. The Ma administration is taking a smart power approach, combining Taiwan's soft, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> soft power and hard power in dealing with the South China Sea disputes. Accordingly, a decision was made to organize several visits by college students and scholars to board the ROC Navy's warship to the Spratly Islands in July, August 2011 and 2012. Uh, this year, another visit to Taipei Island, that's Itu Aba, or Taipei Islands, in the Spratly, uh, was just made uh, last month. And on its way back, um, the warship was followed, followed by a military aircraft, P-3C, from the Taiwan's partners in the region, and I believe that's the United States. But in April and May 2012, respectively, several Taiwanese lawmakers visited Taipei Island and, and the Pratas Island. One of the proposals these lawmakers made after visit is to ask President Ma to visit Taipei Island. Um, so that's the other proposal. I don't have time to elaborate, but this is one of the proposals. Quite often, Taiwan's sovereignty and maritime uh, claims in the South China Sea are considered identical to those claimed by China. As a result, Taiwan is not considered a major player in the South China Sea disputes. Actually, however, differences can be found in Taiwan's and China's policy and behaviors in the South China Sea. It's clear that China is taking a more assertive approach in support of sovereignty and maritime claims, which is clearly different from a rather passive, soft power-oriented approach adopted by Taiwan. But recent development in the South China Sea have created a number of policy challenges and opportunities for the Ma administration in the South China Sea. For example, how to respond effectively to the action taken by other claimants, such as Vietnam, the Philippines. How to counter increasing military spending and arms procurement of the claimants in the South China Sea. How to deal with the increasing US concerns and involvement in the South China Sea issues in particular, the continuing implementation and possible adjustment of the American strategy of rebalancing toward Asia. So how to cope with the increasing call for cross-strait cooperation in the South China Sea. How to handle increasing possibility for the adoption of the code of conduct in the South China Sea and to avoid Taiwan's being further excluded from the negotiation process. So, Last one, how to respond to the increasing international call to clarify the meaning and legal status of Taiwan's youth ship line. So time does not allow me to address these issues. In my view, support for Taiwan's participation in the 
regional security dialogue mechanism is increasing. Why so? Because first, the cross-street relations have improved a lot over the past four to five years, which make it more likely for China to consider adopting some kinds of flexible arrangement that paid a way to, for Taiwan to play the more important role in the process of managing potential conflict in the South China Sea. The Ma administration is taking the position that current cross-strait engagement should be, constant, should be centered on trade and economic exchanges. And there will be no talks on cross-strait cooperation in the South China Sea. However, there have been seems increasing core both in Taiwan and China, mainland China that for Taiwan's participation and cross-strait cooperation in dealing with the South China Sea issue. That's one of the challenge. Four days ago in Singapore, U.S. Defense Secretary Hegel stated that the United States strongly supports the efforts made by the PRC and Taiwan in recent years to improve cross-strait relations. If that's the case, and if cooperation in the South China Sea is considered helpful to improve cross-strait relations, mm -hmm. Beijing government needs to consider it seriously to find a way for Taiwan to participate in, in the negotiation process and in the regional security me mechanism that discuss the South China Sea issue. On the other hand, for Taiwan, there's need to include the South China Sea issue in a talk between Tai. Uh, Taiwan's Strait Exchange Foundation and mainland China's uh, Asso Association for the Relations Across the Taiwan Strait. Another reason for the increasing support for, the United, for, for Taiwan is the increasing support from U.S. Congress. There has been seen uh, a, a number of uh, uh, congressional support in the United States. For example, the, the, the bill, Taiwan Policy Act of 2013, which was passed on April 25th this year by the House Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific. This bill, if it becomes law of the United States, would authorize the sale of F-16CD aircraft, allow high-ranking Taiwanese officials to visit Washington, authorize the transfer of the commissioned missile frigates and to Taiwan, and support Taiwan's membership of international organization. In addition, a number of bills proposed in the U.S. Congress list Taiwan as one of these claimants in the South China Sea territorial disputes and suggests that there's a need for ASEAN to include Taiwan in the diplomatic process. Time is running out. Uh, I'm going to give you some kind of a policy recommendation from my side as academic, academic to President Ma. There are a number. The first one, I think President Ma should pay a visit to Taiping Dao, to Aba, inexpertly. And when he go there, he can say a lot of things. Import, most important one, peace initiative. If China and ASEAN member country cannot work out on the adoption of the code of conduct. The second one, sending a clear message to Beijing government regarding the importance and the need to include Taiwan in the track one diplomacy that deal with the South China Sea issue. And third one, making more effort to seek support from the U.S. State Department, from the U.S. Obama administration to support Taiwan's efforts. And number four, to res respond seriously to the international call for, clarif cl for the clarification of the meaning and the U-shaped line and Taiwan's claim in the South China Sea. And then we, Taiwan has to play a more active and constructive role in the Indonesian-led South China Sea workshop. Then Taiwan needs to re revisit the 1993 South China Sea guidelines. I think there's a need to draft a new one, South China Sea guidelines, in, in accordance with recent development in the South China Sea. And Taiwan needs to convene more domestic international conference, just like, like the one here, or the meeting in Hanoi, meeting in Beijing, in Haikou. I think it's very important for Taiwan to con convene those in, uh, conferences to explore the possibility for Taiwan to be included. And then the, the last one, and then the, the, the second last one is considering the need to include the South China Sea in the future cross strait talk. Finally, maybe it's important to assess the possibility and utility of proposing a peace initiative in the South China Sea. 
which I heard that uh, Mr. Yong said that who can oppose the, the peace initiative? If you cannot work on adoption of code of conduct, maybe Taiwan should take the responsibility and propose a South China Sea peace initiative. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Song. Okay. Thank you, uh, Murray, and uh, sorry because of only 10 minutes, that's why I have to you presentation to show some map to shortcut my uh, presentation. Uh, we will talk about recent developments and um, some of my observation on dynamism of uh, recent development, especially between uh, respected players in the South China Sea and we talk about recent development in uh, the first and second work, uh, conference here. So my uh, focus is on just last year, since 2012, and we put in the broader picture of South China Sea since uh, 2009 and 2010, something like that. We see some um, incident and some friction in bilateral uh, relation, for example, between China, between China, Philippines, between China and Malaysia. Uh, for example, in uh, June last year, when Vietnam passed the law of the sea, it's an effort to convert the international law, especially the UNCLOS, into domestic uh, legislation, bring the uh, domestic law in conformity with uh, international law. And China uses the, as protest to adopt uh, multi-directional uh, responses. For example, elevating of Sansa City, Invitation for uh, bidding, international bidding of nine blocks within Vietnam is uh, easy. Deploying a large number of paramilitary vessels to patrol the South China Sea. And uh, China for the first time putting the military forces in Sansha City under the combat ready position is uh, sending, is clear uh, deterrent message sending. And we have some incident with fishing boats in Paracels in the uh, northern part of South China Sea when China applied uh, unilateral fishing ban. And uh, just recently, uh, China Navy opened fires at Vietnamese fishing boats in the Paracels. And we have also uh, incident with oil and gas development. Here is a map. Uh, you can see the incident happened in the outside the mouth of Tonkin Gulf with the uh, um, the, cable, the, the third cable cutting incident relating to the Vietnamese uh, seismic undertaking survey ship was cut by a uh, Chinese fishing boat in this area. But significant is the area of incident in, on the western side of equidistant lines. So according to international law, it's on Vietnamese side. Uh, turning to china philippines relation, uh, we have famous incident with Cabro confrontation when the uh, Philippines uh, adopted a, a not very wise, for, a wise tactics of using Navy ship to arrest uh, fishing boats from China. And China applied a very well-coordinated strategy, uh, including civilian, paramilitary, military, diplomatic, economic, and propaganda elements in this well strategic, uh, in well coordinated strategy. And it's the end Philippine initiative uh, arbitration process, and China returned uh, Philippine is not verbal. Uh, regarding to other uh, claimants, uh, we see um, the first time we have an incident between China and Malaysia. When Chinese maritime surveillance ship harass Malaysian exploration ship within Malaysian continental shelf, and Malaysia responded quietly and bilaterally. But the recently, when uh, we have other kind of uh, friction between Malaysia and uh, China, when Chinese Navy conducted landing exercise in Zemshou area, just uh, 
50 nautical miles from uh, Malaysian, uh, Malaysian base lines, but around uh, 1,000 miles from Chinese uh, Hainan. And if we put the incident in the picture, you can see uh, the picture here. The incident happened in last year. But if we, if we put in the broad, broader picture of incident happened since 2009, you can see this picture. And it's a continuing tendency of um, diversify of incidents, diversify of, uh, um, of type of incident with law enforcement, with fishing uh, dispute, with oil and gas exploration, with uh, landing exercise, with military activity. And it's a continuing tendency, and we can expect in the future also. According to some bilateral uh, issue, we have uh, other unilateral activities. Uh, for example, action taken by China, uh, China adopted a regulation on board and shirts uh, by Hainan provinces. China issued a new passport with nine dotted line. China also uh, um, conducted Navy exercises in Basi, China, between Philippines and Taiwan. It's, uh, Yesterday morning, somebody mentioned of, uh, sending a clear message of, uh, relating to the issue of freedom of navigation. China conducted a tour to Paracel and uh, continued with the unilateral fishing ban. Vietnam continued with oil and gas development within 200 nautical miles. Uh, we heard um, Dr. Gu mention there's other claimants are conduct are uh, exploiting oil and gas in disputed area, but from from Vietnamese per perspective, what they are doing is on continental shelf and easy according to inter international law unclosed. And in reality, no claimants are now de developing oil and gas in Spratly. Nobody. What they are doing is just extracting oil and gas within 200 nautical miles, as China is doing uh, within Chinese easy around Hainan, undisputed area. And Philippines also conducting some unilateral activity according to uh, recent development. U.S., uh, we see a comprehensive in U.S. policy towards the uh, Asia Pacific and in particular the South China Sea with diplomatic and political element, with economic element, with, uh, U.S. concentrating on trans-Pacific uh, partnership agreement. It's uh, some kind of, uh, some, it contains some strategic element to move closely uh, U.S. and other countries in the region. Military aspect with rotating base in Australia, plan to move a military, a 60 and 40 percent of Navy forces to Asia Pacific. And Hillary Clinton, of course, you know, declare U.S. national interest. But the question here is uh, about sustainability of U.S. Uh, rebalancing uh, regarding to budget constraint over stress in other region also. And other country we see, other countries have huge interest in issue of peace, stability, freedom of navigation, respect of international law, and they pay more attention to the South China Sea. Japan, Australia, India, Russia, EU, uh, voice concern in regional diplomatic forums such as the IDM, IDM, IDMM plus EIS, RAIF, and ASEAN also. And they enhance activity with re relevant countries promoting maritime security, security cooperation, especially Japan and India. ASEAN, we see ASEAN uh, could not um, conclude a joint statement in Cambodia last year, but they can reach a six point statement and more importantly, ASEAN could reach a consensus on basic elements of COC. And whilst now they try to incorporate uh, the basic element into discussion, the future COC between ASEAN and China. At the same time, we don't see any significant progress in DOC implementation despite uh, two years in adoption of guidelines for DOC implementation. And the future of COC is the open question. 
So here's some of my uh, personal observation. We should China accepting this made ASEAN claimants more concerned about their security and stability. So less active and less attractive of China's uh, so-called soft power in the South China Sea. And many ASEAN countries strengthen security re relationship with US and welcome quietly or openly welcome US presence in the region. And US have more excuse to engage in the region and influence on this issue. The more powerful China becomes, the larger US interest in the South China Sea will be. And US policy has spilled over efforts in the position of other major powers, as I mentioned before. This major power pay more attention to the South China Sea. And the, as a reason, South China Sea become much more international issue. And China press war on international oil and gas company make US express views on unimpeded commerce and more determined protecting the interests of American cooperation. And ASEAN claimant have to sort to cooperate with international oil and gas company from major power. So with the eyes that China cannot threaten this company because of major power backing back this up. And the South China Sea become an area of intertwins of major power in interest. And the situation is more internationalized. The situation that China did not expect. And now the South China Sea became a uh, priority in China foreign policy decision making process. You know, before that, as you know, before that China uh, concentrated only on big power relation, but now China elevated the South China Sea into higher level of priority. And as a reason, China approach become much more coordinated and centralized. And, and centralized. And as a reason, competition between ind independent uh, players, between ind independent interest group within China are manageable. And there, were, there was reports that China are now unifying various law enforcement agency into a unique uh, agency. And we see China approach to what the South China Sea um, can be flexibly adjusted when Chinese leaders consider it is necessary. And China have to care about relation with ASEAN in dealing with South China Sea issue. And we can see uh, China approach is expanding but low intensified dispute with increasing presence of civilian paramilitary within the NIDOT line, and they refraining from using military, but continuing to so forth. Uh, and China offering economic incentive to ASEAN countries, especially to non claimant and prevent ASEAN from forming a common position. And acting by this way, China is incrementally limiting the possibility of the US in engaging in the South China Sea issue and incrementally changing the status quo in the region. And US is facing the dilemma, not ratifying UNCLOSE is limiting US legitimacy to criticize other countries of uh, not respecting the international law. And the increasing presence of US Navy forces do not have much impact, uh, impact on the context of control of resources, which is mainly between law enforcement agency and we can see in Scarborough incident, the US, despite US efforts of mitigation of issue, China took control of uh, Scarborough under the nose of US Navy forces. And on diplomatic arena, country, uh, ASEAN countries now have to take more into account Chinese inter, uh, concerns than the US concern. And on multilateral dip diplomacy, the effect of Clinton remark is not as strong as it used to be since the US has not expressed more viewpoint on the recent speech. And we can see in the most recent speech, no more point. So implication for ASEAN is international law is being ignored. ASEAN centrality is undermining. And the next three and four years, very cr critical period for ASEAN. Because when the administration panel decided on the issue of between Philippines and ASEAN, uh, Philippines and China, 
that we encourage other parties to go through third party, a third party arbitration, and they prefer this channel than the ASEAN channel. So my conclusion is that the South China Sea become unbalanced uh, equilibrium, something like that. China is dominating on the sea and on diplomatic arena. US is still seeking approach how to deal with a rising China. ASEAN is being fragmented and can be hijacked by any single chair or even member. Each star regional powers have huge interest, but limited role to play here. So in the long term, um, we, the problem is in the long term, uh, the South China Sea has been regarded as that's whether China rise is peaceful, whether China will respect the current international law. But we can see the situation is now in the diverse uh, direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tui. Before we, uh, perhaps before opening the, the, the floor uh, uh, so that you can ask questions of our very diverse and interesting <laughs> panel, uh, I might let them, uh, the panelists, uh, if they have any, let's say, two-minute intervention, short response to any of the, what the others said or questions that you'd like to ask the other panelists. Is there anybody that would like to comment on what others said, or should we open it to the floor? Okay. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nong Hong from the China National Institute for South China Sea Studies. I do have a question for Professor Castro from the Philippines. Castro. Castro. Yeah. Might Thank be you. mistaken for Fidel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I will remember that forever. So, my question is putting aside the legal merit of which country actually owns Scarborough Show, let's consider consequences of the Scarborough Show standoff after April 2012. I read the media report about the interview between, interview about a Philippine fisherman and a Chinese fisherman. The message I got from the report is actually that both countries' fishermen are enjoying very harmonious relationship between each other. One example is that the Philippine fishermen saying that Chinese fishermen actually is willing to share with them waters and food so versus the other situation. So my question is, how do you expect Chinese law enforcement agency not to do anything in a situation where Chinese fishermen are facing the gunpoint from the Philippines uh, Navy instead of Coast Guard, which is a more legitimate law enforcement agencies. So in your point of view, does it do any good to the, actually the fishermen from both countries whose livelihood rely so much on the fishing in this traditional fishing ground. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good point to raise, the fact that you have this sort of a, a term used by a Filipino fisherman that it was a sort of a mini UN, where you have Vietnamese, Chinese, and Filipino fishermen meeting there, exchanging food and water. That's great. But how come now China is preventing that from happening again? The fact that you have a seclusion zone 25 kilometers around the shoal. So if that's the ideal situation, why not return back to that situation? You know, that was the, uh, uh, the agenda, you know, that's the sort of the motive when we have this mutual withdrawal, that we go back to the status quo where you have a mini UN. Instead, you have now a chain tied around the shoal and you have the seclusion zone. And you know, you ask me a question, who owns it? In March 2001, you have the Philippine Navy apprehending eight Chinese fishing vessels. Uh, there was, of course, a reaction from the Chinese embassy saying that this is a traditional Chinese fishing ground, but not Chinese territory. In fact, the, uh, the foreign ministry in Beijing even apologized to the Philippine government saying, we will do something to prevent this from happening again. Isn't that a tacit recognition? that China recognized at least the Philippines has jurisdiction over that area. Of course, everything changed last year. Thank you, Bonnie Glazer, CSIS. I have two questions. 
Uh, my first question is for uh, Wu Shetsun. I think it was last year at the Shangri-La Dialogue that you talked about the different uh, schools of thought, three different interpretations in China of the nine dash line. And um, I think you suggested, and I heard from ch other Chinese scholars, uh, that there was some uh, pr discussion in China about further clarifying the nine dash line. People suggested after the leadership transition uh, in China that there might be some further clarification. We did hear a statement last year from the Chinese foreign ministry, which I think you basically repeated today that the nine dash line doesn't include, it doesn't mean that China um, says that it claims sovereignty over every drop of water within the line. So um, China is telling us what the nine dash line isn't but still is not telling us what the nine dash line is. And so I wonder whether um, there is going to be any further clarification of that uh, in the future, because uh, so far, you know, we have not heard uh, any, any further clarification. My question for Dr. Uh, Sung is about uh, two of your recommendations, which I actually see as somewhat contradictory. One is that you think that uh, the South China Sea should be put on the table of issues uh, with uh, mainland China. And the other is uh, that you think that uh, Taiwan should further clarify this, what you referred to as the U-shaped line. And I wonder what you really see as the benefits of talking about this issue with mainland China, because I see some risks. Uh, South China Sea has become one of the most contentious issues between China and ASEAN. And if Taiwan were, in fact, to take sides with uh, Beijing on this, I would think that Taiwan would also be introducing some tension in its relations with, uh, with ASEAN, uh, potentially making it more difficult to negotiate you know, bilateral free trade agreements, uh, conduct fisheries agreements, et cetera, which I think is very much in Taiwan's interests. Um, the other recommendation is what I think is really more important. This is originally the Republic of China's, you know, 11-line in 1947. So if, uh, it, it actually would be, I think, very helpful if Taiwan would clarify what this line means, uh, and it would set a model uh, for mainland China as well, if you are defining this in terms of international law, uh, the land features that, uh, that you claim, and then as uh, Joe Yun told us over lunch, um, defining then the maritime spaces that extend from those, uh, those land features. And so I do wonder how you view it and whether there's any discussion within Taiwan of maybe clarifying this line. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, I think the U ship line must be a big concern um, from our participants here. So, as uh, I still remember that uh, last year, uh, just in this room, I have had explained on this U ship line. You might know the U ship line was published by then Chinese government, the Republic of China, in 1947. At that time, there was, to be honest, there was no official meaning on this U-ship line. And uh, it was adopted during the 1950s, 1960s by uh, some countries, for instance, Japan, even Soviet Union, France. Uh, there, is, there are at least four you know, sorts of on this U-shaped line. But in my personal opinion, this U-shaped line, if we needed to clarify the special meaning or uh, official meaning on this U-shaped line, at least uh, should be the line of the ownership of the all features inside the U-shaped line. So why China currently, or in Chinese government has not clarified the official meaning or stance on this issue line. Suppose that if China declares the official meaning of this issue line, it means that 
the current Chinese government should take whatever to take back those islands which are currently occupied by relevant countries. So, in my opinion, maybe ambiguous states, stance currently is the best, best, best choice. Best choice. So, I think if China, you know, if the the the, the, the U shape line, you know, declared by Chinese government as a ownership line. China would take whatever they take back of those islands uh, currently occupied by relevant countries. I don't think uh, relevant countries are ready and uh, willing for this. Thank you. Yanghui? Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Glaser, for, for your very good questions. Um, allow me to respond. The first one, Regarding the U ship line, the 11 dash line, um, which was uh, announced in 1947, um, for Taiwan, yes, it's, it's important to, to clarify the meaning and uh, legal status of, of that, uh, that, that line. But do you think it will be easier <coughs> and will be, have more authoritative interpretation by the government of Taiwan if? Taipei is invited to the negotiation process. And before that, we are out. We have no position and no opportunity sitting on the same table to make explanation. And if that's the case, <coughs> that's first note. The second one, in 2010, President Ma received an inter interview by an associate press. He said that <coughs> Taiwan will abide by the rule of international law. And he was asked about the freedom navigation. He said that freedom navigation in the South China Sea, the, encircled by the u ship line, will be respected. Now, some people ask me that, that the claim between Taiwan and mainland China is the same, identical. But I will tell you, no, they are different. 11-9 11 11 and 9-9, the two <coughs> lines were deleted by the Chinese government in 1953, right? And I will tell you the difference because the, uh, President Ma is the international legal s scholar before he became the president. And he's keen to follow the rule of international law. Look at the recent dispute between the Taiwan and the Philippines. Violation Article 73 of the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. So my understanding that is Chi Taiwan, the, the government is in the process to consider to make clarification of the U-shaped line. But it's slow, I'd agree, but it's important to do that. I, I will urge that Taiwan to be given the opportunity to participate in the international negotiation process, especially Czech one diplomacy, based upon a number of flexible arrangements. I will make come to your second question. Yes, it's indeed a challenge for Taiwan to have those kind of risks because Taiwan has to maintain very good relationship with the United States. Taiwan has to maintain and promote political relationship with ASEAN member countries. And so there are other issues, TPP and RCEP. In that case, Taiwan has to make a balanced position. In that case, I think it's very important for Taiwan to find a win-win-win approach to deal with the situation. How to do that? Cross-strait cooperation will be track to diplomacy. For example, in this coming summer, I'm going to organize the students came from Taiwan's a student from mainland Met, China and Taiwan to go to go uh, to study the South China Sea issue. In the future, maybe students from America, from the Vietnam, from uh, other countries, Japan, can join that. And we are going to turn this, this, the, the, the South China Sea from confrontation to the, the sea of peace and, and cooperation. So uh, thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Sun. Peter. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, three quick questions for uh, Wu Chutsun. Um, I was really taken by your point about um, uh, the law needs to be clear about uh, how much uh, maritime jurisdiction can be claimed from physical features. And so it, it made me wonder, why would China not want to participate in the arbitration process, since that seems to be one of the questions the arbitration panel has been asked? 
important to answer. So I thought that was a very good point you made, but it makes me wonder why China won't participate in the arbitration to help solve that. Um, for Dr. De Cruz, um, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. <laughs> De Castro. <laughs> we'll get it right eventually. So uh, the <laughs> there you go. Uh, the question for you is: um, Would would the Philippines be willing to um, engage in meaningful bilateral negotiations with China uh, if China uh, were to come forward and, and engage uh, in meaningful bilateral negotiations, and then eventually withdraw the arbitration if those can be resolved peacefully? And then for uh, for for Tui. Um, you had a list of Chinese actions in the South China Sea related to what I would say some are some are actually coercive, but others are just mere irritants. And and I wonder in separating the two, um, one of the more important ones. It's not you know not like a, a, a nine dash line and a passport, which frankly really doesn't matter. But what does matter is things like the Hainan regulations. Um, and, and have you noticed whether those regulations are actually attempting to be enforced, or are they more in the category of an irritant? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Peter. Before I answer your question, I would like to say a more a few words oh, uh, with regard to the U-ship line. Uh, my institute and uh, my counterparts who are in Taiwan now uh, are conducting a uh, research pr project on the U-ship line based on official archives of the ROC period. So after we completed this uh, research project, uh, we would like to put forward suggestions to our relevant authority based on this uh, academic outcomes with this U-shaped line. Uh, address Peter's question, uh, why China you know, uh, don't want to participate in the arbitration process. As you might know, the Chinese government has already rejected the arbitration proce proceeding initiated by the Philippines uh, last uh, uh, January. So from my perspective, the problem between China and the Philippines with regard to South China's issue is the, or substance is the sovereignty issue. The fact is that the Philippines illegally occupied the eight islands or islets or shores, lives since you know 1950s or 1960s. The first one, the big, uh, the second biggest island in Chinese name, Zongyi Island or, or Sitio Island. Zongyi Island still carries the name of the warship due, uh, after World War II. Uh, then uh, Japan surrounded uh, and handed over this island to the Chinese government. So the substance, the, uh, the, the real problem is the sovereignty issue rather than the status of the U-shaped line, rather than the legal status of the eight rocks in the statement or notification delivered by the Philippines. Another reason why China has rejected the notification of statement by the Philippines is that in 2006, China made a, a declaration under the Article 298 of UNCLOS to exclude all disputes with regard to sovereignty delimitation or EEZ in or uh, military activities in its EEZ. So hence, until China withdraw from this declaration, any disputes with regard to sovereignty issue, you know, should be excluded from the compulsory settlement uh, mechanism. Thank you. Uh, my straightforward answer under this administration, no. We will proceed with the arbitration process. Uh, it's mentioned in the case we filed that we have engaged China in a bilateral negotiation since 1995, when you have the discovery of Chinese structure on mischief reef. Nothing happened out of how many 15 years of bilateral negotiation 
So what's the point of returning back to bilateral negotiation? So I think under this administration, no, we won't back out from this arbitration case. Yeah, um, thank you, Peter, for the question. Um, I listed some action not only by China, but uh, Ajay Clemens on show about uh, recent developments. But um, significant is from Chinese side. And uh, we see some action from China was interpreted by China as reaction to other countries' uh, activity. But other action is uh, unilateral action, despite any uh, uh, action from other countries. And um, specifically on the um, regulation of Hainan on what and search and arrest uh, of foreign vessels into Chinese uh, waters. Um, there, is two, there are two aspects of this, this uh, regulation. First, maybe reaction to other, as it is uh, as it is, it is written, as you mentioned. But when China adopted uh, uh, domestic legislation, the uh, authority, more, specific, uh, more specifically, uh, law enforcement agency have to follow the domestic law. And no matter what intention of, uh, of the government when adopt the, the law, their law enforcement have to follow this. And it will create more tension, more incident on the sea. And in reality, after adoption of this law, we see new incident between uh, Chinese law enforcement and Vietnamese vessel in the Paracel, for example. And I think this, the question can be answered by Professor with Professor Wu, who, who know more than me about the intention and content of this reg regulation. We're getting an awful lot of hands, and so what I'm going to suggest to uh, maybe facilitate is that we um, have two at a time. So uh, you're next on my list, and then Mike. To you, sorry. Okay. Actually, okay. Don, it's the guy next to you, didn't? He had his hand up first, uh, sorry. Uh, actually, uh, my, uh, I'm Tang from the Vietnam yeah. Laws Association. Uh, my question is actually to, uh, raised by Bonnie I already about the nine dash slides. So uh, okay. I think I uh, give my uh, right to uh, my. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. The mic's there, but. I am not hijacking the microphone <laughs> or ASEAN. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I have two questions. Uh, I'll try to stay out of the weeds. You know, we, we tend to get granular, especially on the law of the sea. Uh, my first question uh, is, is to Dr. Wu. Um, as I review my notes of what you just said, now maybe I'm grasping at straws, and I can't resist admitting that you have just argued the utility of ambiguity, right? In other words, by not clarifying the line you avoid, forgive my vernacular, pissing people off. And the implication is that if you did clarify the line, it would be the maximalist version. We own everything. At the Jakarta International Defense Dialogue some years ago, not too many in Jakarta, I asked uh, a gentleman dressed in a PLA Navy uniform. This is an authentic source. And I said, why doesn't China clarify the nine dash line? And he said a much shorter version of what exactly you just said. Namely, if we did, it would create widespread anger in the region. So be glad that we don't. Okay? <laughs> now, you can see how this actually subverts your own logic. Because it means that those who want to know what the line means are even more inclined to believe the worst. And therefore, to raise tensions. Okay? Now, let me, on the positive side, say this. As I understand what you just said a few minutes ago, you did pose a distinction. I'm probably naively exaggerating its importance, but you did pose a distinction between the nine dash line in relation to a historic claim, and you talked about the four island groups, that is the land features, presumably bringing to mind UNCLOS, the settlement that would be allowable under UNCLOS rules. So basically we have two interpretations. One is we own everything on the basis of historical claims which can only be settled by the Court of Justice, the ICJ, which you will not appeal to. Or alternatively, we might be nudging slowly but surely, because there's internal debate inside China, 
your colleague had an article suggesting there were four different schools inside China on the matter, but we're moving slowly towards something that would be compatible with UNCLOS. That is to say, eventually to say, we own the land features, but we don't have sovereignty over the sea, which would open up the Greg polling option and would make what we saw on the screen perhaps meaningful in policy terms. So tell me why I'm wrong about being optimistic in that regard. Okay. And uh, the other question, I guess, well, I'm sorry. The, I, pardon me? Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, first, I just want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Tweet for a very, I think, strategically insightful and sophisticated uh, uh, presentation. Two quick questions. One for Dr. Song. You, you carefully answered Bonnie's question by saying what Taiwan, what Taipei government, the Republic of China's position on the uh, 9 dash or 11 dash or U shaped line. Uh, as a Berkeley trained lawyer, I'd like your opinion of what the line means. Uh, and for uh, Dr. DeCastro, um, I just want to clarify the Philippines' claim to parts of the Spratleys. Is it based on Thomas Cloma's discovery in the 1950s, or what is the basis for your claim to a big chunk of the Spratleys? Okay, we'll, we'll um, Dr. Wu and then um, and me. Dr. DeCastro. And then, and then response Dr. to the note. Uh, I would like to clarify that uh, the ambiguity or ambiguous stance is my personal opinion. It is not a Chinese official stance. So I just uh, ask you, suppose if China, uh, as you might know, there are at least uh, three, you know, minions with this U-shape line, the line of traditional maritime boundary, the line of historical rights, the line of historical waters, and the line of the ownership of the uh, U-shape line over all features inside the, the, this line. Uh, is it acceptable for international community if China declares this line as uh, ownership line, then China would like to discuss the, you know, delimitation with relevant, co relevant countries based on the island regime. If some features, you know, fit the uh, relevant uh, criteria set out by the UNCLOS, is it possible? Is it acceptable? Uh, and also I would like to make sure here, there is a little room for current Chinese government to compromise with this U-shape line. Or in other words, the current Chinese government has no right either to abandon or change this U-shape line. Thank you. Uh, regarding the Philippine claim, in 2009, uh, the uh, president signed, uh, uh, then President Arroyo signed a law which basically provides for UNCLOS, using UNCLOS as the basis. So uh, Mr. Bensurdo might be in a better position because he's a lawyer, but the point is it's simply based on UNCLOS, regime of violence. I, I don't follow that. Uh, uh, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I cannot really explain everything. I basically discuss. Uh, well, with uh, regime of violence, you talk in terms of regime of violence. So that it deals with Taiwan. Yeah, so, and not all the Spratlys, but about some of the islands there. Uh, only about six islands, plus, of course, including Scarborough Shoal. Within the Philippine Sea, uh, ex yeah, yeah uh, in the, within the Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McDevitt. Uh, about the, the, the question from Taiwan's perspective, in 1994, I wrote an article issues, uh, published in Issue and Studies. In that article, I, I make clear my position as a, academ from academic academia. That is, the line is, it indicates 
the ownership of those islands within the U-shaped line. But now, to be honest with you, I admit, according to international legal practice, there is a very, very strong legal challenge for both Taiwan and mainland China. If you look at the Italos, look at ICJ cases, and it comes to the question of maritime delimitation, maritime, and then that would be the uphill challenge for, for, for Taiwan, for mainland China. And President Wu mentioned that there's a need for Taiwanese scholars to conduct joint research on the legal meaning of that U-shaped line, light dash line. Yes, it's ongoing, but please take note of the uh, diplomatic notes issued by PRC in May 2009 and April 2011. If you look at combine those two diplomatic notes, you can find out the Chinese position is the following. I think the author, maybe Dr. President Wu or uh, Dr. Hong Long can clarify that. First one, sovereignty. Second one, unclosed. The third one, historic rights. And you are right, we cannot only focus on law of the sea convention, but you have to deal with international law. So from that, in that case, from for Taiwan's perspective, it's very, very difficult. We have no seat, no opportunity to submit our legal position in the UN meeting and so on. So that's a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Leo Bernard from Center for International Law in Singapore. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. De Castro and Dr. Wu. Uh, Dr. De Castro, you mentioned that uh, with this administ the current administration in the Philippines, you don't see the Philippines going back to the bilateral negotiation table with China. Uh, how do you see uh, the how do you see the Philippines and China relation after? the conclusion of the arbitration proceeding because the arbitration would not resolve the sovereignty issue and wouldn't uh, resolve the maritime delimitation issue. So even if, even if the arbitral tribunal uh, give a uh, positive judgment to all the Philippines questions, the Philippines will still have to go negotiate with China for the delimitation and boundary issue. And to Dr. Wu, I want to uh, ask your, uh, your personal opinion in what do you see, uh, how, how do you see China will react towards the, the possible judgment of the arbitral tribunal? Um, as, as a lawyer, I was actually kind of hope that China would participate because uh, even though I, I agree that uh, I, I understand that China challenged the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, but I think that's, I, I was wishing that was something that China would argue in front of the tribunal. And to be honest, I think some of the points raised by the Philippines, there's a good chance in the merits China would actually have an advantage over the Philippines. But that aside, uh, that aside, how do you see uh, China will react to this possible result of the arbitration? Do you think uh, uh, China would risk uh, maintaining that balance of kind of like uh, ignoring the, the, because China has been ignoring the existence of the tribunal so far, would China would continue to do that? Or do you think China will quietly take into account the, 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 the points made by the tribunal and use it for negotiation with the Philippines? Or do you see any other possibilities of what happened afterwards? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Andre Sovizio, I'm a, a chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company, but I have another hat I want to wear to ask the question. <laughs> I'm also one of President Obama's presidential uh, partners and uh, a founding member of Organizing for Action. So I wanted to ask, uh, I think with Dr. Tui particularly, but it would also could apply to uh, Dr. Castro, but on Dr. Tui, you gave the most, from my standpoint, most realistic, hard-hitting, you know, description of the situation like it really is. And so, because I'm, I was actually in Vietnam when they cut the cable, the Bing Ming High, and uh, just, you know, right into the ec economic zone and just cut the cable and they couldn't keep their seismic survey going. So these are the realities. Now, 
My question, and because you outlined so brilliantly what the U.S. is doing and all, what would, what would you want the United States to do that it is not doing that is within the realm of possibility? I mean, uh, that, that it's feasible. For example, you mentioned becoming a, a that we should ratify uh, the UN Convention, the UN, UN, uh, UN class, and, and uh, that we should do that. I think so too, but I've heard that debated internally within the United States government. Uh, so how, do you think that would be helpful? Uh, and uh, to what degree, and what else? I was surprised you said you don't think the big warships we're putting out there are so particularly helpful. What kind of, of things could we do that we're not doing? And remembering that we want a better relationship with China, but of course everybody does, but not at any price. Thank you. Yes, my name is Eric Lachica. I'm with the local chapter of the U.S. Filipinos for Good Governance. Uh, many of the Filipino Americans are concerned with the recent incident when the uh, the Chinese uh, naval uh, forces were about to blockade this uh, just a few days ago, where there's a dozen Philippine Marines on an, I an island or a shoal uh, close to, close to the Phil Philippines. What do you think will uh, Dr. De Castro or Dr. Wu? What would be the possible scenario? Uh, that might lead to something out of hand, and uh, how can it be prevented? Will will China uh, attempt to blockade the Philippine Marines to starve them out, basically, and not allow Philippine Navy folks to replenish their food supplies? That seems to be a flashpoint. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, six minutes, so please, uh, all the uh, panelists, keep your answers short, but try to to cover the turf. Thank you. First question, response to you, my friend. Uh, in my opinion, with regard to the opposition, you know, uh, proceeding, uh, as we know, China has rejected and uh, returned the notification and the statement delivered, uh, submitted by the Philippines to Chinese government last uh, January. So I don't think uh, the Chinese government will accept any awards which could be delivered by tribunal, uh, arbitration tribunal in the future because you know China has already rejected and uh, without participation of China. Uh, second question to my friend here. I think it's uh, about uh, the second Thomas Shaw, currently in the incidents between China and the Philippines. The fact is that uh, since uh, later 1990s, the Philippine Marines, you know, has been garrisoning on this atoll or reef. So now the Chinese uh, Law enforcement agency is doing is to protect this reef from being occupied by the Philippines permanently. Thank you. So also, I would like to make a response to the Scarborough Shore uh, by Dr. Castro because you talked, uh, you know, quite more. <laughs> uh, I still remember that. Uh, during last year, Shangri-La dialogue, both uh, your defense minister, Gajmi, and I attended the workshop with regard to the South China Sea issue. We discussed the Scarborough Scor issue. And uh, I asked him, and I showed a map, maps published by the Philippines in 2006 and 2011. I asked him, you said the Philippines enjoys jurisdiction over Scarborough Shore. How it comes? Your maps showed that the Scarborough Shore is situating out of, the, out of the western limits of the Philippine territories. He made no response. Okay, thank you. 
just respond to your question. The filing of the case is part of our diplomatic strategy of legal approach, rule-based approach. So, uh, and definitely we would negotiate with China. You know, China is a neighbor. Uh, there's a time that we enjoyed very good relation with China. And, you know, I'm not discounted the fact that soon, you know, in the future, we might, again, uh, discover this good relation. We would have to negotiate. But I think just in case we win the case, that will give us a degree of leverage. If we lose that case, then we will have to accept it. As a law-abiding nation, we would abide by the decision of the tribunal. Now, the next question regards to uh, what do we expect from the United States? Uh, Assistant Secretary June Acting came out with basic principles, great principles. But what will happen if those principles are openly challenged? You know, what point there is credibility? What if a state, another state, glaringly challenged this? Adopt unilateralism, threaten force, what then? Will those principles be backed by muscle? or just diplomatic protests. And of course, the concern right, right now in the Philippines with the meeting with President Obama and Xi Jinping is, now this is of course a concern, that a line might be drawn. And where is the Philippines in that line? Or you go way back to 1938, is the Philippines a far away country, coating the veil, Chamberlain? You know, it's supposed to be a strategic ally, but is it? A faraway country? And of course, a question regarding the Marines. Uh, of course, we have a standoff. Uh, recently, of course, a supply vessel was harassed, 2 a.m. in the morning. So, so, but uh, we haven't really gone into that, what I would call a classic Mexican standoff. They're just watching each other, and let's see what will happen after you have the summit in California. We, I don't know. It's a reality that small powers would have to face. We could only rely on opportunity. We could not create the situation. Dr. Tui, I think it's up to you to have the last word for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, what I expect the U.S. to do is not um, more than what the U.S. has to do to protect uh, U.S. national interests, as the, today clearly laid out by uh, Mr. Zhou Yun. We see U.S. The policy and strategy towards the South China Sea uh, is uh, relatively comprehensive with uh, military, diplomatically, and um, political elements. But what is lacking is paramilitary elements and economic ele elements of this grand strategy. As you, may, as, as you see in my presentation, U.S. cannot interfere or influence on the real contest of the Chow China Sea. It's between law enforcement agency. And other aspect is that uh, China now is using economic incentive to divide and rule ASEAN. So just in this aspect, U.S. cannot do anything if U.S. stay away from economic um, spheres in the region. One more U.S. Uh, can do according to U.S. The national interest is more asking China to clarify, and even not clarifying, but abandoning the nine-dotted line. As, as today uh, Dr. Song mentioned, China already clarified the nine-dotted line. According to the uh, notes to CLCS, uh, to United Nations, just lie is indicating sovereignty, unclosed, and historical rights. What the U.S. is to do is not asking to clarify, but asking China to abandon the lie. It's not basic on international law. So, uh, but U.S. interest is to respect the international law, the current international law. So it's on U.S. interest. Thank you. Please join me in uh, thanking all the panelists for a rather rousing uh, discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure.